Coming up first at 10, the first presidential debate of the new century is history. Tonight, Team 12 coverage. Also an Oregon town where the faucet's gone dry. Tonight, how people are coping without water. And a baby comes into the world a hero. See why he's so special. It's 10 o'clock. Live, Kurt Ludlow, Shauna Parsons, meteorologist Rod Hill, and Tim Becker Sports. This is the 10 o'clock news. Good evening. It was billed as a make or break night in the race for the presidency. But will the first debates make a difference? The 10 o'clock news has you covered tonight with Team 12 coverage. First, KPTV's Anna Katayama is in news control with the highlights. Anna? Well, with a race between Governor Bush and Vice President Gore so close, many thought tonight's debate would be pivotal. Now, there were a few sparks that flew, but for the most part, it was a civil conversation. Here tonight is a look at some of the highlights. With every detail carefully negotiated, from the temperature in the hall, 65 degrees, to the height of the podiums, 48 inches, the Republican and Democratic presidential candidates meet each other for their first debate. That eight years ago, they campaigned on prescription drugs for seniors. And four years ago, they campaigned on getting prescription drugs for seniors. And now they're campaigning on getting prescription drugs for seniors. It seems like they can't get it done. 95% of all seniors would get no help whatsoever under my opponent's plan for the first four or five years. I guess my answer to that is the man's running on Metascare, trying to frighten people in the, in the voting booth. On the environment. Uh, Governor Bush is proposing to open up our uh, some of our most precious environmental treasures, like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, to the big oil companies to go in and start uh, producing oil there. I think that is the wrong choice. It would only give us a few months' worth of oil. The only way to become less dependent on foreign sources of crude oil is to explore at home. And you bet I want to open up a small part of a, a part of Alaska, because when that field is online, it will produce a million barrels a day. Today, we import a million barrels from Saddam Hussein. On the federal budget surplus. I think we have to make the right and responsible choices. I think we have to invest in education, protecting the environment, health care, a prescription drug benefit that goes to all seniors, not just to the poor. Under Vice President Gore's plan, he's going to grow the federal government in the largest increase since Lyndon Baines Johnson in 1965. And we're talking about a massive government, folks. We're talking about adding to or, or increasing 200 new programs, 200 programs, 20,000 new bureaucrats. A For the most part, the candidates maintain their composure throughout the hour and a half debate. Though at one point, Governor Bush did lose his train of thought. Well, I've been standing up to big Hollywood, big trial lawyers. Um, what was the question? It was about emergencies, wasn't it? Well, Governor Bush did mention a Northwest issue tonight. He talked about his opposition to breaching Northwest dams. Now, the vice presidential candidates will face off on Thursday. The next Bush-Gore debate is set for October the 11th. And then one more after that. All right, Anna, right. thank you. Attending the debates tonight, Skip Lozier. Yeah, he joins us now live from Boston. Skip, the question, were there any big surprises in the debates tonight? No, no real big surprises in the debates uh, tonight. No man hit a home run here tonight, and neither made a major miscue. By the way, there are some instant polls out tonight. Two of the three of them show that the voters who watched the debate tonight seem to think that Al Gore may have had a slight uh, improvement in his position over, Vice, or over Governor George Bush, though, but that both men really improved their public images. Skip, there was a lot of uh, talk tonight, earlier today, about the Kennedy-Nixon debate, a lot about appearance and how that really kind of changed the way voters perceived those two candidates. Anything stand out tonight in the way of appearance when it came to Gore or Bush? Uh, not really. Uh, Governor Bush looked like Governor Bush. Uh, honestly, he tends to be a little more relaxed in this kind of situation, as your piece mentioned. He did make one small stumble there, but not a major one. Vice President Gore was uh, fairly relaxed, and for Al Gore, very relaxed here tonight. Uh, but again, they went after each other on issues that they have been after each other on for some time. All of their answers pretty well rehearsed, almost short speech-like. Uh, as opposed to just off-the-cuff uh, give-and-take. Yes, yeah, Skip, here's another poll that uh, we just got that you may not even be aware of yet. It says uh, four out of five high school and college debate coaches picked Gore as the better debater uh, over uh, the governor. Do these uh, debates, did this debate really make a difference in voters' minds, you think? I think that's going to be hard to tell yet. Uh, the real question comes down to, in a day or so, how many of the undecided voters say they are no longer undecided? 
And that, that's the real question here. If, uh, if they fall to Al Gore's side, that's a major, major help for the vice president. If they fall to George Bush's side, that's exactly what he needs. All right, Skip Lozier, thanks for that live report. Well, there was plenty of reaction to tonight's debate from students at the University of Portland. UP is one of dozens of schools nationwide taking part in what's called Debate Watch. That's a program to promote people talking about the debates. They didn't address the environment. They didn't address very much about education. They, uh, I didn't think they really got to the heart of the campaign financing issue. Um, they didn't address corporate donations, corporate anything. I was disappointed with the last question that they asked of the candidates and that was about the character. I think that's disappointing that the media has to stoop that low. Now I myself am a journalism major and I hope the media changes in the future. It's kind of hard to know um, what, what they're really saying when they're you know, arguing like that. And the university will host debate watches for each of the next two debates. Hundreds of protesters in Portland are calling tonight's presidential debates unfair. That's because the Green Party's Ralph Nader was not allowed to take part. In fact, Nader got a ticket from a college student but was turned away at the door. KPTV's David Wilson joins us from Oregon's Democratic headquarters where protesters demonstrated earlier this evening. David? Yeah, Shauna, uh, Ralph Nader hoped to see his face on uh, millions of television screens across the country tonight, but of course that did not happen. He was kept out of the debates. His supporters say that robs Americans of their true democracy. They say, let Ralph debate. Well, millions of Americans prepared to watch Democrat Al Gore and Republican George Bush go at it on network television. Bush and Barr, they make me want to Ralph. Hundreds of Ralph Nader supporters in Portland Nader, 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 protested outside the Oregon Democratic headquarters. We're protesting because this is totally anti-democratic. They call the presidential debates a sham. If you can't hear somebody's views, then how can you uh, make a credible choice? Polls show Ralph Nader with 8% of the Oregon vote and 4 to 6% nationally. For president, we're not you for vice president. His supporters believe that should be enough to get him into the debates. He stands for cleaning up our political system and giving the uh, voice back to the average American, reigniting American citizenship. We really need to shake up this country and find a way to get back to democratic principles. We want democracy, not a mediocrity. Green Party members in Oregon say they're willing to vote for Ralph Nader and risk giving George Bush the election because they say the country is in need of deep political change. Both of those two parties are bought 100% by corporate America. And corporate America does not want to involve the grassroots and the individuals in decision making. Because they lose money? They lose money. Now, NATO supporters have not given up hope of getting their candidate in the next two debates coming up in the next few weeks here in the month of October. Uh, but he has to have about 15% of the popular vote, and right now, across the country, he only has about 5%, so he has a ways to go. Boy, David, I saw a lot of those Let Ralph Debate signs up in windows around town today. Yeah, they were uh, all across the town, and actually, there were uh, several hundred protesters out here, and I think there would have been more people out here, except uh, it was right around the time of getting off work, so a lot of people uh, were, were not able to get out here uh, in time. All right, thanks a lot, David. Well, protesters in Massachusetts who were upset about Nader's exclusion from the debates participated in the Boston TV party. A group of demonstrators known as We the People tossed their televisions into the harbor. It was, of course, a parody of the Boston Tea Party when back in 1773, a group of colonists threw the equivalent of millions of cups of tea into the harbor. So what is your opinion? Did Ralph Nader have a right to debate? In fact, should all third party candidates be allowed to participate in the presidential debates? That's tonight's 12 Talk Back online poll question. Log on to our website at organs12.com and we'll have results on tomorrow's 10 o'clock news. Now, elections are just over a month away now. Be sure to stay with KPTV, Organs 12 and the 10 o'clock news for continuing coverage of the presidential debates as well as election night coverage for Oregon and Washington. A Washougal teenager is on trial accused of killing her father in part because he wanted to spend more time with her. KPTV's Jim Hyde reports on a crime that has shattered three families. The charge against Tiffany Williams is first degree murder. The state's argument that the 17 year old daughter of Jim Williams and her boyfriend Colin Folsom and their friend Jason Schrader 
spotted to kill Mr. Williams as he slept last November 11. This was a brutal homicide. This man did not die easy. His body was sliced repeatedly more than 75 times. The prosecutor told the jury Tiffany Williams confessed to police about her role in the crime and bragged about it to another inmate at the Clark County Jail. Kinney promised to introduce audio tape, transcripts, and testimony from both women. But Mr. Fulton becomes kind of this force in her life that leads her to run away from home. The defense pointed to Tiffany's friends and sought to discredit the inmate, a thief and heroin addict. She does admit that she left him in the house. There's really no testimony to submit to you as to this alleged plan. The victim's wife and defendant's mother took the stand, testifying that Tiffany had a good relationship with her father, but changed her attitude and style of dress in the months before his murder. Mrs. Williams and her eight-year-old son found her husband's body. Walked in the bedroom, I saw the spots, I saw the blood stains on the blankets, and I walked a little bit past bed, I saw him, the pistol. The prosecutor alleged that Tiffany herself had taken a couple of strokes among the more than six dozen wounds the medical examiner found on the body. The defense argued she was not an accomplice to the crime. The jury could begin deliberating the fate of Tiffany Williams as soon as Thursday. Then the two young men whom prosecutors say plotted with her and then hacked Jim Williams to death are set for trial later this fall. In Vancouver, Jim Hyde, the 10 o'clock news. Prosecutors say Jim Williams attempts to restrict his daughter's time away from home and the fact that he worked for the government as a computer specialist for the Corps of Engineers for possible motives for the murder. A man shot to death by Gresham police has been identified now as a suspect in a robbery and attempted murder. Police say 19-year-old Justin Gallegos drove up to a Gresham man on Sunday and pointed a gun at him. The man was robbed and told to walk away. He says he heard two gunshots behind him and felt a bullet graze his neck. Gallegos was later shot to death by Gresham police early Monday at a trailer park. An accident involving a semi-truck injures two people and snarls traffic out of downtown Portland for several hours. The semi was headed to I-5 southbound and apparently lost control near the I-405 junction. The trailer flew up into the air, tore a hole in the center divider, and hit two cars. The truck driver and a small child were injured. Yet another rate increase is planned for Portland General Electric customers. The company has already planned a 13.5% uh, rate increase for January. The other hike will be about 5%, and it will go into effect in October of next year. The first increase was to pay for a hike in the cost of wholesale electricity. The other will cover labor and technology costs. Coming up, most of an Oregon town is without water tonight. It could stay that way for some time to come. We'll take you to the town to see how people are coping at 10:15. Also, a new class will soon be taught at your teen school, The Importance of Life, a new hard-hitting campaign to stop teen suicide at 10:32. Plus, a baby is born to save the life of his big sister. It's an amazing story at 10:46. On the weather deck, it's a bit chilly and I should have a jacket on. High temperature today 65. The low this morning was 46. It's going to be another cool one, possibly some frost around. My complete pinpoint forecast at 10:26. I'm Ken Ackerman. And I'm Kimberly Moss. Tomorrow on Good Day Oregon, Olympic great Kathy Rigby talks about playing Peter Pan. And we're going to take a trip to the Ponderosa Guest Ranch tomorrow on Good Day Oregon. I spent 23 years of my life caring for people, counseling the families of cancer patients, and helping disabled veterans. Congressman Brian Baird. Today, I'm working to make sure you and your doctor make medical decisions, not HMO and insurance company bureaucrats. And I'll fight to protect Medicare include prescription drugs, and make sure everyone can afford the medication they need. Brian Baird, our congressman. Together, we can make our community strong again. Come to where the ideas and the savings grow. The Portland Fall Home and Garden Show. See the newest and best home improvement and garden products. Compare styles, compare costs, and enjoy special show pricing. It's all under one roof, so you save money and time. Don't miss the 16 garden vignettes and huge plant sale. Hear from America's flower man, Dale Roman, and home improvement expert, Bob Yap. It's the biggest and the best, the Portland Fall Home and Garden Show, this Thursday through Sunday at the Expo Center. Coming home to Elmer's is something people have been doing for a long time. Now there's more menu variety. Dutch apple French toast topped with cream cheese and cinnamon streusel. County Fair chicken and dumplings simmered in a rich creamy broth. 
and a delicious 10-ounce New York steak served with an Oregon Bay Shrimp cocktail. These are only a few of our new fall menu items made from the finest ingredients and served by people who really care. Elmer's, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm a Republican. I support a woman's right to choose. And I hoped George W. Bush would too. But Bush says he wants to take away a woman's right to choose and to cut funding for family planning. And Bush is willing to appoint Supreme Court justices who oppose a woman's right to choose. That's a risk I don't want to take. I don't want government in my private life telling me what to do. And that's why I have a problem with George W. Bush. Get the facts at PlannedParenthoodVotes.com. Hundreds of Oregonians have no running water tonight, and it could be that way for weeks. Something happened to the water supply in Grand Ronde. That's a small town between McMinnville and the Oregon coast. KPTV's Drew Mickelson spent the afternoon there to see how people are getting by without water, Drew. Well, Kurt, nearly 400 people in Grand Ronde have no running water to drink or wash with tonight, and they haven't since last Wednesday. No one's really sure how long they'll be without water, and no one knows what happened to their water. When Sherla Jean Abel turns her faucets, Nothing. her sinks stay dry. Abel's daughter had to bring in buckets of water that her mother is now storing outside her home. Bring the water in and strain it through a cloth to get clean water and then heat it on the stove to be able to do the dishes. And that's the same way you do if you want to take a sponge bath. Abel is one of the nearly 400 people in Grand Ronde who have lost their running water. The whole town isn't waterless, just some residents, like Jim Aguirre, who's frustrated about having to get his water from someone else's hose. We're having to boil our water in order to do our dishes. You know, it's cost me money to go to a laundromat. I pay 56 bucks a month for water. And now I'm not getting reimbursed for anything. Folks out here in Grand Ronde say things like cooking and cleaning have truly become chores because of the lack of water. But they say the biggest inconvenience of all is the fact that one of these honey buckets is now their bathroom. But we're frustrated. I mean, I... Terry Osborne is the chair of the Rock Creek Water District Board. The district's reservoir has been leaking since last Wednesday. We don't know where it's going. We lost about 50,000 gallons in a little over 24 hours. The district shut down the system while workers tried to find the leak and what's causing it. Holler if you need more. <laughs> the board is trying to help by giving out water. Folks in Grand Ron say there's just not enough free water to go around. I don't know, it's just turning out to be a real joke. But not a funny one. No. The folks without water are getting frustrated, but they are trying to stay positive, and they're also having to get a little creative. One woman said that when she had dirty dishes over the weekend, she just put them out on her back porch and let the heavy rains wash those dishes. She said... Mother Nature, with a little soap, did a pretty good job on those dishes. Great I don't, idea. Uh, I hope they don't all just uh, stand out on their decks to take baths. That no, happens. they have yeah. not had to do that. So how long will it be before the water's back on? They don't know. They're saying at least probably a week or so before these folks get their water back. And then after that, they say it could be another week or so. They really have to find where the leak is coming from in the reservoir before they let anyone drink that water again. So they say it's going to be a while. Mm. All right. Thanks a lot, Thanks, Drew. Drew. Well, soon area anglers may not be able to legally catch salmon in the Sandy River. The Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is considering a ban on salmon and steelhead fishing on the Sandy River. The plan also includes shutting down the Sandy River hatchery. The Fish and Wildlife Department says the hatchery may be good for fishermen, but it's bad for wild salmon. Biologists say the hatchery-born fish weaken the gene pool of wild salmon. Should it be no smoking in Lake Oswego? Lake Oswego City Council held a public hearing tonight on a smoke-free workplace law. It would prohibit smoking in all workplaces, including restaurants. Bars would not be affected, though. The ordinance is supported by the Coalition for a Tobacco-Free Clackamas County. A similar ordinance passed in Multnomah County back in 1999. Some major improvements are in store for the Broadway Bridge, but it shouldn't affect your commute too much. Only one traffic lane will be closed, bike lanes will remain open in both directions, and one sidewalk will remain open for pedestrians. The project will update the old lighting system and crews will move street lights to create more space for bicyclists and pedestrians. We're one of the only cities in the country that has movable bridges, and these bridges are even more um, complicated and oftentimes very old structures, so sometimes the parts need to be custom made just to, um, just to keep them updated. 
The project will begin later this month. It's expected to be finished by next April. Trouble on the high seas for a cruise ship that began a Caribbean cruise in Portland yesterday. These are pictures of the SS Vendum uh, as it was getting ready to leave the port of Portland. Well, by the time it was eight miles off the Oregon coast, a generator had failed. That cut electrical power to heating and cooling systems, lighting, ventilation, running water, and other ship systems. In fact, the crew had to stop the engines to repair the generator. It was finally restored this morning. So are you still trying to dial seven-digit numbers when you're on the phone? It's day three of mandatory 10-digit mandatory dialing in Oregon. Last night in our 12 Talk That online poll, we asked if you had any problems with 10-digit dialing over the weekend. 41% of you said you didn't have any problems. 38% of you said you forgot to dial 10 digits, and 19% of you said you couldn't make your call even after dialing 10 digits. The boys of summer began their auto run for the World Series today, and there is good news for Mariner fans. The Mariners have taken a 1-0 series lead over Chicago, and Tim Becker is here to show us how they got it done. Hi, Tim. I'll tell you one of the ways they got it done. They weren't playing at home. They've been horrible at home lately, so I think Had it's to go a, on the road. Yeah, huh? good thing they're a couple thousand miles away. The Mariners won eight of their final nine road games during the regular season. So you better believe they weren't the least bit worried about opening things up away from Safeco Field. Instead, they were in Chicago, where they picked up a few runs right away. Two in the first, then in the second. Joe Oliver sends a solo home run into the left field seats. That made it 3-0 Seattle. But the White Sox were right back in it an inning later. Tied 3 all when Maglio Ordonez rips a Freddy Garcia pitch down a right field line. And that scores the go-ahead run. It was 4-3 Chicago. Look at Ray Durham. Keep it that way. Beautiful catch in the fourth. But the M's retie the score here. Mike Cameron, the RBI single in the seventh inning, and it would go to the tenth inning tied for all. That's where Edgar Martinez gets busy. A two-run home run to left field. His teammates are pumped, and that is how they do it, gang. Seven to four, Mariners, the final from Chicago. All right, Hot Shots tonight involves another baseball playoff game, an exciting and, you know, somewhat bizarre event for Cardinal pitcher Rick Ankeel. Especially for Rick, you know, you get a chance to start the first game. But uh, for me, you know, I just kept trying to tell myself it was a normal game, and, you know, and just trying to treat it like any other start. Especially. Uh, his performance was anything but normal, though. Third inning against the Braves today, and Keel unloaded a barrage of wild pitches. Five of them, to be exact. All of them were high fast balls except for one, a curve ball that hit about five feet in front of home plates. It's the most wild pitches thrown in the major leagues in a single inning in 110 years. The last guy to do that was a guy by the name of Burt Cunningham back in 1890 for what's that? what that is worth while playing for Buffalo. As for Ankeel, well, he left the game in the third, but his teammates already scored six runs in the first oh. inning. St. Oh. Louis went on to win 7-5, to five, so he comes out smelling Poor like guy. a guy. Oh, you feel sorry for the guy. What was the He's problem? Kind of nervous. Well, you know, the fact that they won, though, I think helped. Yeah, there you alleviate. go. He just won't be he was tight. He was starting again for a while, That's what it was. Think? Absolutely. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Well, meteorologist Rod Hill says we're in for another cool night. In fact, some areas might hit freezing. He'll tell you where in his pinpoint forecast. Also, could an egg improve your brain power? We'll have the results of a new study in HealthCast. That's at 10:32. Plus, a daredevil parachutist learns a hard lesson about breaking the law. See what happened at 10:53. Tomorrow night at 10, the conditions are just right. This year's grape crop could mean some of the best and most affordable Oregon wine in years. A peek at the Pinot Noir Harvest, tomorrow on the 10 o'clock news. Have Voyager's top officers crossed over to the enemy? I want you to assimilate Voyager. A special two-hour Voyager season premiere. Wednesday night at 8 on Oregon's 12. On prescription medicines, compare. Al Gore will charge seniors a new $600 a year government access fee. George Bush opposes Gore's $600 fee. Gore's plan? When seniors turn 64, they must join a drug HMO selected by Washington, or they're on their own. Bush's plan? Seniors choose, and it covers all catastrophic health care costs. Gore's plan doesn't, and has a government HMO, and a $600 fee, a prescription for disaster. <laughs> whispering past our faces, as if to say, I can breathe life into anything. Clean wind power. Just one more way Portland General Electric is preparing for tomorrow, today. Let the future begin. 
An 11-year-old boy is arrested for robbing a bank. The story behind this preteen robber coming up on the 10 o'clock news. In an emergency, only Country Companies Insurance gives you immediate advice from a claims authority. Country Companies Insurance. Real people, real answers, real quick. I'm Jack Roberts, Oregon's Labor Commissioner and a Republican. That's why some people assume I would support measures 92 and 98, but I don't. They don't belong in our Constitution. 92 and 98 single out workers, limiting their ability to use payroll deductions in the workplace. That's not fair. And under the law, Oregon workers already have the right not to participate in political activities. Measures 92 and 98 are unfair and unnecessary, and I'm voting no. The Department of Transportation now knows how much it'll cost to repair Highway 35. It could be as much as $1 million. Heavy rain over the weekend estimated at more than three inches in eight hours, and that made the White River overflow. It tore a hole in the highway and eroded the sides of the road. But here's the good news. ODOT says Highway 35 will be fixed in time for the opening of ski season. Mount Hood Meadows is scheduled to open around November 15th. Last year, the ski area opened November 26th. And for those of you who weren't with us last night, uh, Shauna Parson joins us now uh, on the anchor desk. Yeah. She is a snowboarder, Rod, looking well, forward to the skiing okay. weather up there on I've the mountain. I've snowboarded a couple of times, and it was really fun, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not the best. I did enjoy it, though. Now, do you ski as well? I do. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not very good at that either, but I, you know, put other people's lives in danger as there I head on down the hill. She's simply not very good. Oh, she's not good, <laughs> oh, but I do it. I like it. I'm looking forward to skiing. I didn't even try that. You ever tried it? Snowboarding? No, it's snowboarding. Oh, it's great. It's easier been. than skiing, I think. You think it's so? a lot of fun, yeah. I have to go up this winter. I need something Definitely. easier than skiing. All right. Well, I'll take lessons together, refresher lessons or okay. something. Okay. All right. We're ending this You'll conversation. Love it. Yeah. Get on together. with it. Hey, we start off with the current conditions. It's clear outside, and ooh, it's starting to feel chilly out there. Definitely a fall nip in the air. 56 degrees. Uh, you folks in Hillsboro right now, this is, of course, the airport along the Columbia River. Up in Hillsboro, you're down to 50. And last night, you folks got all the way down to 35 degrees. I think you have a decent chance to hit 32 by tomorrow morning, so there could be some freezing spots around the region. Uh, dew points are 44. The barometer is holding steady tonight. The wind, northwest, at 9 miles per hour. Satellite picture tonight is a good one. Take a look. We're beautifully clear, and we're going to stay this way for, uh, I think, a number of days. So look for a lot of sunshine tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We have big area of high pressure. It's parked up north of us. The circulation around this, watch the arrow, keeps giving us an east flow for days and days and days. And, of course, that almost always means beautiful sunny weather for us. And eventually we'll start to warm up. This is uh, tomorrow afternoon at 512. Now, by the time we go into Thursday, wind flows parallel to these lines. We get more of a southeast flow. That will zoom us up. I think we have a chance going into Friday to hit 80 degrees for a high temperature. Here's what we did today. You know, it was... Uh, not really warm anywhere. The hot spot in Medford at 73. 61 up in Pendleton, and uh, you folks in Astoria this afternoon, 62 degrees. Our forecast check. We talked about a little bit of low clouds or some fog this morning, basically sunny, and yep, 44. I said it was actually 46, and I said 68, and it was actually 65, so all good marks there. Hey, last night we talked about flooding down in Miami, Florida, and this is what's the latest down there. Uh, they've had 12 inches of rain, ladies and gentlemen, since uh, yesterday morning. You see what those right there? See that car? He's driving in that water. Guess what? He has no idea if that road is washed out underneath him or not. Now, he was okay, but that was a perfect example of what not to do. A lot of people run into serious problems driving through those high spots. Again, 12 inches of rain down there since yesterday. You can see the solid flow. In fact, over Florida, a little ball of moisture down there. The Hurricane Center thought there might be a little circulation forming for tropical depression. They checked it out with an aircraft. Not the case, but more rain expected down there tomorrow. Some hail in these storms in Iowa tonight moving toward uh, Chicago, the rest of the country. Look for yourself. Looks pretty good. Nice and clear down in Texas where it continues to be hot. Temperatures in the 90s that direction. The 80s on the East Coast today. 73 up in Chicago where the Mariners beat the White Sox. 58 degrees up in uh, Wyoming today. I'm a huge baseball fan. 78 degrees out in Reno, Nevada. And in the West, most spots were pretty good and dry. 61 up in Seattle. Look up in Anchorage, only 42 for a high temperature. On the Oregon coast tomorrow, the east flow goes all the way out across the Pacific waters, so not much in the way of any fog anywhere. 
tomorrow should be bright and sunny from the get-go. Newport at 67. Astoria tomorrow the same after a morning low of 40. Small craft advisory, near shore winds uh, picking up to about 25 knots from the north. In the valleys, again, perfectly clear.